Hello, welcome into WLOI, Loyola Radio, streaming online at WLOI.org and Campus TV Channel 111.1. You're listening to After the Whistle, Loyola's premier sports talk radio show. Welcome to our final show of the year. Unfortunately, this is our last show, but we're going to make it a good last one. Last show ever. Last show ever for Jimmy and I, sadly. But we're going to try to go out with a bang today. We have a lot of callers coming on throughout the show. We're going to try to cover a lot of different sports topics. So we're going to try to get into as much as we can, but... Yes, unfortunately, Jimmy, this is the end of the road for the two of us. Yeah, it's very sad. It's actually more like bittersweet more though than sad, um, just because it flew by. Obviously, we did not have that semester in the fall of 2020, and that kind of stunk. Um, and then we didn't, we had our end of our freshman year kind of taken from us too. So it almost felt like almost like, I guess like a semester and a half that we kind of lost out on. So that's kind of stinky way to think about it but at the same time I felt like the last two years was a lot of fun I know we lot of did a lot of different things and you know we've had so many people on I think like definitely having everyone on was like the most fun part of this experience and coming here every day and talking sports with you one of my good friends definitely one of the highlights of my college career and I'll always be grateful to Stefan and James for letting us come on the show freshman year and um Obviously, I hope Andrew next year when he does the show, I hope everything goes well with that. Um, but today's our last hurrah. So I guess enough with the somber stuff and let's get I'm sure we'll get into more of that later. As yeah. Well. But yeah. yeah, it's definitely going to be a great show today. We have a lot of people, like I said, coming on. We're going to cover a lot of things, mostly things that our guests will bring up and stuff that we'll bring up as well. But first, I think we have to bring up the Kentucky Derby. Yeah, it's tomorrow. Yeah, so, finally. I feel like the wait is finally going to be over. It's yeah, been a while. Yeah, so I always say there's that month from Super Bowl to March Madness, and then by the time March Madness ends, you got a month in between the end of March Madness and the Derby, and that month has concluded. We are here. Tomorrow is Derby Day, and unfortunately, it's kind of clouded by some controversy this week, and it's kind of a tough way to kind of enter the derby especially for horse racing because it just i don't know i wish it could have a better look it's just one of the things i wish for but unfortunately four of the horses are now scratched and there'll only be 19 runners so there's usually 20 and then they'll have extra eligibles um but the problem is is there's only so many extra eligibles that you can have who are actually ready to race and they only had three um and then four horses scratched so we only have 19 um so the horses that scratched um, two of them I actually liked, um, like to bet, like as a possible um, play some way or another, whether that be through an exactor or a winner. I'll tell you what, the biggest of the four scratches is um, a horse by the name of Practical Move. So Practical Move is from California. Um, his trainer name was Tim Yachtin, and he's the one who actually ends up taking over for Baffert when his horses can't run in the Kentucky Derby and but this is not one of Baffert's horses this was one of his own that he's had since last year and this horse actually hadn't lost um in a, quite a few races he's won like three or four stakes races in a row ran some really big numbers so that's a big contender that's out of the race he won the Santa Anita Derby um interesting enough though one of the horses that moves in was a horse that finished literally like a nose a neck like behind him so I think that's interesting to see because they have very similar running styles too um, but that horse is by the name of Mandarin Hero, and he's from Japan. So it'll be interesting to see how he goes to Kentucky because the travel from Japan to California is obviously much easier. Um, so the other horses that scratched, there was the Wood Memorial, which is ran in New York, Lord Miles, he's out. And then another horse by the name of Continuar is out. And then Skinner is also out. So we have 19 now. Um, it's very interesting, I think, this year because more than other, I would more than other years, especially, I would say this year is like there's a really good favorite. Um, Forte is there's no other way to say it, but he's like the class. Um, not often enough are you gonna enter um the Kentucky Derby with such a clear favorite like there is in this one. And by the way, for I'm gonna start using the numbers too, because I know people want they watch the race tomorrow. They want to hear all about what numbers people are. So Forte is number 15. Um Forte is on a six race winning streak. So that's that dates back to last September too. And these are all in stakes races, which I think is very cool. Um, but since he started going a longer distance, he's really started to dominate. And that's been like 
five of those six wins dating back to October. And this is going to be the longest distance that he runs. But if you want me to be honest with you, I don't think it will be a problem at all. The one concern I do have about Forte, though, is that he runs from the back. And there have been in years past where favorites have come from the back, like Forte does. And they just have such a tough way of getting to the front because there's so many horses. Think about it. There's 19. You usually have like 8 to 10, maybe 12 if it's a, like a lot, right? But you you throw another seven in there. Think about how much wider you're going to have to go around the turns. And that is the challenge for Forte because more likely than not, he's going to have to go wide. And in his last two races down in Florida um, at Gulfstream Park, which is not too far from Miami, he's come up from some big distances behind. And he's made up good ground. But the question that I have is, it's not necessarily the competition. It's just, can you do it again? Um, and I think that's going to be the question here. But I'm going to be honest. I am willing to take a chance against him just because I feel like it's a lot to ask. You got 19 horses. You're going to have to go wide. It's just the way of, like that it works. And there's a lot of horses that have very close odds with one another. And I'm obviously not a huge horse racing guru, but... Like, well, after that, I would say, if you want to know who's second best, it's probably this other horse who actually is the same exact trainer, tap it trice. But then after that, I would say that it kind of gets very cloudy. Like, I mean, there's, there's a lot of horses in similar, a in lot that of similar horses race. with similar odds, eight to one, 10 to one, a couple of 12 to one, a couple of 15 to one, a couple of 20 to one. Yeah. So it's pretty jam packed there in the middle. Yeah. And I would say like, that's the thing is like after those two. And what's interesting enough is Tap It Trice kind of has the same running style as Forte, where he has to also come from the back. So our two top contenders both have the same flaws. So for me, the kind of approach that I'm taking is I think somebody else can, I don't know, find a way through. Um, there's some interesting horse, and it kind of sucks because I thought Practical Move was one of the guys who could do it. But I'll tell you another guy who I really like. Um, the first horse that I think definitely is going to have like a chance to be a contender in this race, and they're not going to have to worry about the problems that Tap It Trice and Forte are going to have to worry about is a horse number two by the name of Verifying uh, for trainer Brad Cox. Brad Cox won the Kentucky Derby two years ago. Through disqualification, his horse was Mandaloon, who got put up above Medina Spirit. Right. So um, that was his first derby. And he's looking for another. He's got quite a few in here, Brad Cox. But um, the, his number two horse um, is Verifying by the name of Verifying. And actually, believe it or not, this is a horse who's the son of Justify, the Kentucky Derby winner. Okay. So I think that's kind of interesting. Um you know, this horse kind of came out of nowhere in his last race, and he was very close with Tappet Trice. He ended up getting caught at the end by Tappet Trice, but he ran a pretty good race in the beginning, and he was up front. Tappet Trice caught him down, but the same thing is, is like, he's on the inside. He's going to have the ground save that these other horses aren't, and the difference is, too, is Verifying should be able to go to the front. So I would say that he definitely has a chance here um as a contender just because of the speed just because of the ability and based off of his last race definitely gives him a chance and also his uh jockey tyler gaffleone is really good at churchill downs um so that's just something worth noting he knows the track really really well another horse that i like to uh is the three horse his name's two fills i i don't remember what the significance is to that name but i want to say it has something to do with like something sports related i really can't remember what it was i felt like for some reason it's oh you know what it was it's a play off the name two bills from parcells and oh okay uh, bill belichick because there was a horse nice. named yeah so but they did fills instead of bills because it used to be bills there was one with bills but that's where the name comes from anyway this horse two fills um it's interesting he's kind of like you know the lunch pail horse he is from illinois He's been running all over the place. Uh, he ran down in New Orleans. He ran at a track in Kentucky. He ran at a track in Minnesota last year. He ran in Virginia. He's all over the place, this guy. This guy just goes out, and you know what he does? He does nothing but win. Um, he has eight races, and he, he's won four of them. And at Churchill Downs, he's two for one, which I think is a pretty cool stat because he's got to be able to show that he can win there on the dirt. Um, what's interesting enough, though, 
for a horse like two fills is like you got to make sure they like Churchill Downs because it's a little bit of a different surface. And he checks that box for me. And you want to know what I think is also the most important thing. He actually has the highest number in the last race. So his last race was a really bang up performance. But the problem was, is it wasn't on turf or I'm sorry, it wasn't on dirt. It wasn't even on turf. It was on this other surface that's called synthetic. And the going from synthetic to dirt is really tough because synthetic is like its own thing. You just don't know if horses are going to be able to take it or not. Some dirt horses like it, primarily the turf ones like it, but two fills has never ran on turf. Um, he's only ever ran on dirt. And then he obviously ran that awesome race on synthetic. But the challenge with two fills is similar to Tappet Trice and Forte. He's going to be also coming from the back. Is he going to be able to get up there? I have no idea. Um, but that's just like another question that I have. Um, I think some other interesting players in here um, include that horse that I mentioned before. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Let me talk about the Arkansas Derby winner, Angel of Empire. So okay. Angel of Empire, Flavian Pratt is the jockey. Flavian Pratt won the Derby on Country House by way of disqualification over Maxim Security. That's right. So he that he's coming in this race on a two race win streak. Um, he won in the Risen Star down in New Orleans at the fairgrounds. And then he also won the Arkansas Derby uh, in Oakland, which is the track. Um, and he ran two great races there, came from the back, did what he does. My only concern, though, is that he's a horse who's definitely improving. But in every single one of his races, he has like pace to run into. And he's going to be the same thing as Tappet Trice, Forte, and two fills. They're all going to be looking to make that move from the back. And this is why positioning is going to be such a key factor in this, just because all these contenders are going to be the same type of running style. And you know, it's interesting enough too. Um, Angel of Empire actually beat two fills in February when they raced against each other at the fairgrounds. Uh, Angel of Empire Maybe came in that's first. something that should be considered. I, def race. It's definitely something that should be considered. I agree. Um, but the thing that's interesting is that for both of them, or for at least for two fills, that was a race that I felt like was like a preparedness type of race. Whereas Angel of Empire was kind of a little bit like he had a race previously, which allowed him to get in, into shape. And that was not a good race. Um, that was actually at the same track where he ended up winning the Arkansas Derby. But he ran a horrible race that day. It was second. It was not a fast race at all. Was not good competition either. So my concern is, is like, what what was up with that performance? Because he didn't really, I didn't, can't find an excuse for that. Like he just didn't, there's nothing that I can make that tells me like he should have lost that race. And I find that a little concerning. Yeah. And just to segue a little bit, I'm not sure if you know about two Japanese horses in this race. I know you mentioned, I think one of them earlier. Yeah, I can, I can start with. And them. I was going to bring up Derma Sotogake and Mandarin here. They both have pretty decent odds i believe derma sotogake is 10 to 1 and yeah. Mandarin here is at 20 to 1 and they both have pretty good track records i'm looking here at derma sotogake he won the uae derby by mm -hmm. a pretty wide margin five and a half five lengths. and a half lengths and then he switched over to mandarin hero he is making his first i think appearance in the kentucky derby and he has had a pretty good year as well he was the runner-up at santa anita and he also won a race called the Psycho Cannon back in November. Mm -hmm. So he's had- And that was a big race in Japan. Too. Yeah. So the thing is, is it was interesting. So in Japan, the way that they do racing is they have two different circuits, basically like the top one and the kind of like the lower one. This one actually came from the lower one, um, but he never fi finished worse than second in any of his races. He's actually never finished worse than second by a neck. Wow. So he has always ran a great race. But the problem is, is he's going to be in the 18 slot. So that's interesting. How wide is he going to be in the, because he's kind of the same thing as Tappet Trice, Forte, Angel of Empire, two fills. Um, and it's also interesting too, because my concern is what is the jockey going to do from such an outside post? Because you got to remember all those other contenders are on the inside. Do you try and go past everyone else just to get better position, but you might be using the horse up early in a mile and a quarter race? Or do you try and go to the back, get a good position, but then if you don't get a position, good position, 
Um, you might be wide the entire race, which is going to waste a lot of energy, or you might fall so far behind because you were so worried about getting a good position that it might just take you out of the race. So that's like the challenge for this jockey um, who goes by the name of Kazushi Kimura. And he's pretty good. I have to say, I was not like super high on him, but he has kind of really come around lately. I don't think that he's going to be able to win this race just because I think the circumstances are very tough. But had this horse gotten a better post, I think totally had a chance. Um, but I definitely think the Japanese angle is very interesting because lately we have seen like the Japanese runners have stepped up. They have stepped up for sure. Um, and as you mentioned, the other one, um, the other Japanese horse, who's Derma Sotogake, um, he comes off that big win in the UAE Derby, which is in Dubai. Um, so another world traveler. He's raced in Japan. Now he's uh, he was also in um, Saudi Arabia, and he's also raced in Dubai. And now he'll race in America. So my biggest question for this horse is like the UAE Derby was not strong. It wasn't a bit great competition. It just wasn't. And it's one thing to dominate against those horses, but I don't know if that's going to be able to happen again today. I'm going to be on or tomorrow. And also, too, one of the other things that I have to mention about this race is that I feel like there's a lot of horses who are in this race that generally just don't really have a chance. Like the seven um, reincarnate with uh, that's the name. Uh, John Velasquez won the Kentucky Derby multiple times. Um, very good rider. And this is a horse who he's in the race because he got the points. He's had, had a couple thirds in big races, which allowed him to get the points in. But these thirds are like, you know, he's four lengths behind. He's almost three lengths behind. And just he just never really looks like he's ever going to be a contender. Um, what's also interesting, I think, too, is he's just lost to so many other people who have also who are also in this race, such as Angel of Empire. Um, and I, I just don't know. So if I'm going to give a pick, um, my pick will be Tappet Trice. That's my first pick. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to pick Tappet Trice. I hope Luis Saez gets his first derby. I'm a big, really big Luis Saez fan. He rides really hard. Um, could never have a problem with um, him just because I, I thought that the Kentucky Derby, him coming down when he was on maximum security, that stunk. And yeah. he had a chance um, the year that Bob Baffert got, got disqualified. He had a chance too. He had a really good horse, but he wasn't able to pull through with that one. I hope that he gets it done this time around uh, just because – I want to see it happen for him. Um, Seems like he has the horse to do it as well. Yeah, so Tappet Trice is my number one pick. Um, I will say, too, I'll give you like a long shot who I also think could run really big. Um, I don't usually pick like the one slot just because it's so tough. But if you want to talk about a horse for maybe like third or fourth, if you're playing a Superfecta and you want a big number, Hit Show. Watch Hit Show. I mean, this is a guy who... You know, Manny Franco and Brad Cox, who I mentioned before, Manny Franco is the tr uh, the jockey. Well, him and Brad Cox, 77% or percent in the money, in the top three together. Wow. So, and, and this horse, the two times that Manny Franco has ridden the horse, first by five and a half lengths, and then second by a neck. And what I think is interesting is there was such a large gap in between those races. And you know what's even more interesting? When they ran that race in February, I don't think you really knew whether or not Hit Show was going to need to run again before the Derby. So it almost felt like they had to run this race because there was such a large gap. And I don't know if that was exactly the road that they were taking, but he ended up losing by a nose. He still had a decent enough race, I thought. The race came back a little bit slow, but it is also in New York on a cold day. Um, so I, I really wouldn't get too worked up over that, but that would be like my long shot, I think has a chance pick. So that's my Kentucky Derby rundown. Um, we've definitely seen a lot of surprises. I feel like over the last couple of years, I feel like, I don't know, at least growing up for me, I feel like always the favorite would win, but now I think the, 
horizons have expanded so much. I mean, we've seen it's disqualifications. We've seen upsets. Win out I mean, of nowhere. think about last year. That was insane. Rich Strike was an also eligible too. So I'm, I'm talking about Mandarin Hero and how, oh, I don't think he's really got, I mean, he has a chance, of course. Um, he's I, He's a player in here. But I think the challenge for him is finding a way to recreate some of that Rich Strike magic. And I'm going to be honest, the difference between last year and this year, the reason why I'm more confident that we'd see something crazy it they're almost like two completely different scenarios but they're the same thing that could cause craziness last year we had a lot of horses who all wanted to be in the front and they all tired each other out early and then those other horses who knew that they necessarily couldn't keep up and it wasn't in their benefit tried to stay back but then they kind of ran into the hot pace too early and screwed themselves up whereas this year there's not that much speed so are is everyone going to go to the back and is someone just going to walk to the front? I mean, that's that's something that can happen. I think that's the angle. If you like the number two verifying, I think that would be the angle for him. So at 15 to one, I guess he would be my third pick. All right. Yeah, there's a lot to decipher there, but I guess we're going to see how it all unfolds tomorrow. It's 6.57 Eastern time. That is the post time for the Kentucky Derby. Mm -hmm. Lots of exciting stuff. I mean, it's the best two minutes in sports. I say it every year, but it truly is just so dramatic for what can happen in such a short amount of time so now i believe we're going to have a caller on our first caller of the day yeah we do have a caller um it goes by the name of matthew McHale, first time caller many years ago and he's now here for the last time Mikhail, how you doing today my man i'm doing good i'm good, I'm good. In there Yes. Yeah. Great Hank. to have you on. Thank you for joining our last show ever. It's great to have you on. You're always a devoted guest, and we love hearing what you have to say. Of course. My pleasure. All right. So what do you want to talk about today, Mr. McHale? Uh, let's talk about the Broncos. Yeah, let's do it. All let's right. do it. Let's do it. <laughs> Listen, he's a joke. He spent all his money on him. He can't make simple throws. And now you think Sean Payton's going to come in here and and save the day. I do. I do think that. Yeah, you're right. It's not gonna happen. Why is it not going to happen? Dayball did it for Jones. Russell Wilson's a lot better than Daniel Jones is. If Brian Dayball can improve him, why can't Sean Payton improve Russell Wilson? No, no, no. I know Russell Wilson is better than Daniel Jones. Look at their careers. It's not even close. Yeah. Difference between the two. Yeah, sure. Daniel Jones. Is a young quarterback that's improving every year. Russell Wilson's an old quarterback that's not improving every year. Russell Wilson is a Hall of Famer who had one bad season. Yeah, his most current season. How old is he? 33? But what is this? J uh, he's 33, yes. Yeah. But what he's is this Daniel Jones? Like, you act like this guy had this amazing season. He had 15 passing touchdowns, not 25. I get the eight or the seven or eight rushing was really good, too. And it was nice to see him take a step forward. But I don't know, like, to, for you to just throw out Russ's entire career and act like Jones is way better, I think it's just incorrect, Mikhail. Every, everyone's always talking about the stats. No one's talking about the game. You don't watch the game. You, you don't watch how he manages the, the clock. You don't watch how he manages drives. You only watch. You only yeah, because he's a game time. manager. Russ is worried about making plays when he's out there. Well, not last year, no. But I would say in Seattle, he made a lot of plays. I would know. You would know, too. Listen, Cody, you're saying all of this about how his career, how great of a Hall of Famer he is. What else do I have to go off, though? Listen, let me, let me finish not a little concerning that his most recent season as a 33 year old was abysmal it's not a little concerning to you that doesn't doesn't cross your mind at all it concerns me but we also had first of all a clown as the coach let's not act like that guy was knew what he was doing nathaniel hackett was incompetent the the going from nathaniel hackett to sean payton is like going from I don't even know, being out on the street to living in the Taj Mahal. Like, that's how I look at it. I'm sorry. Like, that's honestly how I feel. Okay, but, but let's, let's talk about this. Why He can't make simple throws. I so disagree. I think he can make simple throws. If you're talking about the turnovers, yeah, he made turnovers last year. I think there was a lot that went wrong. Obviously, it was not a good season for the team. But I think to throw out Russ's entire career just based on one season, you got to remember too, Matt Hill. what did Russ deal with the entire season? He had a torn hamstring that he played through the entire season, and he couldn't run until the end. And we saw when Russell did run, 
there were three games that he was able to run. The Chiefs game, where he led a comeback of 28 points. They ended up losing because he got hurt. But he started running, and he was able to make things happen. The next time that he also played well was the next Chiefs game. Had the offense going a little bit. We had a penalty that went against us, a really bad offensive pass interference. But the offense looked good that day. Oh, and then what's the other game that he was able to run? The Chargers game. How'd that go? Pretty good. Really good, actually. So my whole thing is, as long as he's healthy and he's able to run, I trust Sean Payton to do a good job with Russell Wilson. So with that, what you will, whether that means running backs running or quarterbacks running, I don't think it's going to be throw it 40 times like it was last year because that's just a stupid plan. Well, it, it the thing is, Cody, he's again, he's he's getting old and he's coming off a hamstring injury. Like you said, you think it's you think it's a good idea to have him run around like a bull in a china shop? I think it's a good idea. What, what if he gets hurt? Then you're then you're screwed. No, and that's what happened last year. I'm not saying I'm not here to take away his abilities of oh, will he? Won't he get hurt? Like oh, what are you just going to tell Lamar to stop running? No, no like that's the way he plays. Like yeah. unfortunately, we're going to have to just adjust and protect him the best we can. I think that was why we made some offensive line moves. But at the end of the day, I mean, I still think Russ has a chance to bounce back. I would say other quarterbacks like. You know, Deshaun Watson, Baker Mayfield, I think they have a chance to bounce back too. I mean, you saw what Geno did when he got his chance. Like, you got to give these guys a chance to actually succeed. I think you would say the same thing about Daniel Jones, right? He needed a chance. He needed some coaching. Yeah, but he's young. He's, he's improving every year. Listen, Rounds I'll say this. Decline. I'll chime in just to give you two a little bit of a break to digest your thoughts a little bit. Listen, I hear what both of you are saying about Daniel Jones and Russell Wilson, and I know that this conversation, I think, was meant to be about the Broncos itself. Now, listen, it isn't disencouraging that Russell Wilson had that kind of year last year. And I know that he was dealing with some injuries and incompetent coaching, as Jimmy said, and I agree with that too. But I do think when he's at his peak, and I'm not sure if he can get back to his MVP caliber peak, I think he can get close to it, but I don't know if he can get it again. I don't know if he, I don't know if he can get close to that though. Like, I think what's a realistic expectations you think? Do you think he could throw, I don't know, like 30 touchdowns. I do. I think 30 I think touchdowns is a, is a, is in the realm of possibility. I think if he could throw 30 touchdowns, I don't know, maybe he, around, I don't know. I don't know. If under 10 picks, like eight to 10 picks. Is that reasonable? I think that would be a great I think season. he could get back to that. And listen, I know that last season definitely did not show a sign of that, but I think now with Sean Payton there and hopefully he gets more chemistry with the receivers. I think it could happen. Now for Daniel Jones, I agree with Mikhail. I do think that his, career is on a slight upward trend i mean last year who had more passing touchdowns last year but um your job is to pass as a quarterback listen i do think but i listen i i agree with both of you i think (laughs) that is true you're right you do have to win games i'll say this about the um no 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 if you throw three picks you're and you win the game they won in spite of you like a zach wilson like, like they, the Jets would win in spite of Zach Wilson sometimes. Let's say if you throw, if you throw three picks and then you throw what four touchdowns and you win the game, you have a, a two minute drive to win the game. You're you're gonna blame it on the quarterback. Well, 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 I mean that's a completely different scenario. I thought just three picks in general. Of course, if you are a quarterback who has an awesome game winning drive, then yeah, we're gonna give you the credit. Like, sure. okay, I think that's fair. But did Daniel Jones do that a lot, or he just was his good game winning drives just handing the ball off to Saquon? No, man. He the, they didn't they didn't run the ball that much, dude. They they really didn't. They give they they give Saquon the ball a lot, but they they weren't just running it down teams' throats. That's just not Listen, that's not the reality of it. I'll say this about the Daniel Jones Russell Wilson comparison. If you're asking me. If they're both at their peak, who would I take? I'm probably going to take Russell Wilson. It's not even close. But listen, I'm going to say this. I will say I do think there is more pressure on Russell Wilson next season than there is on Daniel Jones, just for the simple fact that the Broncos traded for him. They paid him all this money. And for him to have that kind of year last year, I think it's very disencouraging. But at the same time, I think Russell Wilson has the capability to bounce back because we all know what he can do with his arm. He's one of the deep balls the best deep balls in the nfl and he has proven that he can be an effective runner and i think the broncos should use him a little more as a runner because like jimmy said when they did run with russell wilson it was pretty effective but i will say this about daniel jones i think the fact that last year since he didn't really have any major turnovers in the sense that they were really game killers i think that was huge and also i think brian dayball 
really simplify the offense. And I think it put more pressure on Daniel Jones to make plays. I don't know when he like had to, it's not like he had to make a play every single time because he could just hand the ball off. And I think they use him well as a runner too, because he can also run the ball pretty well, but I will no, say that's probably jo- like, honestly, I'll give credit to Brian Dayball. I think the best thing he ever did with Jones was tell him to run. And I think the eight or he had seven or eight rushing touchdowns this year, whatever it was. That's a great thing to add to your arsenal. If he gets to 25 passing touchdowns though, and then has that seven or eight, or maybe gets it up to 10 and can come up with 35. I Daniel Jones would move way up my list. Like, honestly, I really, I, I can't listen to this anymore. It's all about touchdown passes and, and stats. Touchdowns I win games. About, what? Touchdowns win games. You can't win unless you score. I would I know. Let's say, let's say we get the ball in the, uh, in the third, uh, we're th- on the three yard line. Let's say we get the ball on the three yard line. Are you gonna pass it in? No, we're the, one of the best running backs in the league. We're gonna we're gonna run it in. You know, so you're you're saying all this all this about stats that don't mean dick. Okay, uh, what, what what matters is you win the game. Now, I'm tired of hearing, oh, if Daniel Jones has 30 touchdown passes, he's gonna be he, he'll go up on my list. Why does that even matter? Why, why does it matter? Because he's got to have production. He's got to have production. Yeah, yeah, he does have production when they're winning games, and he's and like Jeffrey said, he's not making crucial turnovers, drive killers like that. That's that's a good quarterback. Well, it don't matter. I mean, I looked at I look at that as the bare minimum for a quarterback. If you want me to be honest, like Daniel Jones, his last season is like the bare minimum of success. Bare minimum. They made the playoffs. Yeah, no, no. Was I'm talking about on a personal note, not on a team note. I'm talking about Daniel Jones personally. Like I thought that was like the barely bar for success. Like, it was great that he stopped turning the ball over. He showed that he could do some things. The team won, obviously, so that helped everything. But can, be honest, if the Giants missed the playoffs, do you think Jones would be getting all this credit with the same stats? Yeah, no, if, if they weren't winning games, no, he wouldn't. That's not that's exactly my point. Okay, well, my point is, despite you guys winning games, I still don't think Daniel Jones is that good. But I, I, of course, you don't. You, you will never give a giant player any credit. Whoa, 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 whoa! You will never give a giant, a jet, um, a, a chief, a, a charger. You'll never a raider. <laughs> you'll never give any of them any sort of respect. So probably so. not. Probably not. I mean, I respect. I respect. Uh, respect a lot of guys. I respect Saquon. I respect. Andrew Thomas. I respect Dexter Lawrence. They're all great players. They're... Speaking of Dexter Lawrence, congrats to him on yeah, this big that, that was a good signing by the Giants, Dexter Lawrence. Yeah. Are you happy with that? Yeah, I'm definitely happy with that. Yeah. Sweet. All right, really quickly, I got a question I want to fire back at you. So what's your expectations for the Hall of Famer Daniel Jones and the Giants next year? Like, what do you see? Like, perfect season running it to the Super Bowl? Or what's your expectations? Do you think they'll be facing off with the Broncos in February sometime soon? I think I think they'll they'll probably lose like three or four games in the regular season. I don't see why they can't win a Super Bowl. Um, do you think that they can win the division next year? Oh yeah, I'm not worried about the Eagles. Okay, Jeff, anything to say? Listen, I actually might sound crazy. I think there's a way that they could win the division. No, their offense but is going to be a lot better. They have better talent. Our divisions with Waller very and I at the top. I mean, you look at the Cowboys, the Eagles, and the Giants. I mean, those three teams were all playoff teams last year. All made it at least to the divisional round so Mm -hmm. they all won at least a playoff game so i think going into the year those are the top three teams but i don't think winning the division is as crazy as it sounds for the giants now i think they would have to have some things go their way i think daniel jones would have to continue to transcend as a quarterback i think he'd have to take another big step forward which i think he can do and then i think some luck would have to go their way maybe the cowboys and eagles fall back a little bit and i could honestly see that happening so i think there's a path there for the giants yeah, definitely. I definitely think there's a path there, too, for some success. But at the same time, I think the Cowboys and Eagles are just better teams, so I can't really see them finishing ahead of them, though. But I think the expectation for the Giants should certainly be around making the playoffs. Like, if they don't make the playoffs, that's a disappointment, right, Mikhail? 100%. Yeah. All right. Um, anything else you want to say for the fans out there, Mr. Mikhail? No, that's it. That's what- been a pleasure for you guys having me on the show i, I hope, wish you guys best of luck um uh, moving forward um keep grinding keep working um you know in, in the future you know I, I think w Lloyd, like they don't really they don't really care about you and no i disagree i think they care about us i think they care I, about us the thing is that you got you're, you're what do you got a zoom call right now 
Uh, we're on a phone call right now with you. Phone call, right. So, I mean, there's... You're talking about the computer with the Zoom. I agree. I agree. I wish we still had the Zoom. I'm a little annoyed, too. It sucks. Oh, I'm talking about you guys. The video quality is terrible. Uh, That's our computer, man. Why, why don't you, you guys should be demanding better quality, man. Cody, you, I, first day I met you four years ago, I said, this guy has a talent. He knows what he's talking about. He's got his charisma. He's funny. He can you can make it big in this world. You just need to, you just need someone to help you with the with the editing and, and getting content out there for people. And, and I don't think they did a really good job at all. No, nah, I mean honestly, I think it's about yourself. I think you you get in what you put out. So I, I disagree. Three grand investor to pump your year, whatever it is, and and what do they? What is where's that money going to? They should they should upgrade. I think it's going to Boulder. Do you see the food they're serving over there? It's it's amazing. All right, we got to take a quick break, though, because we're running out of time here on the Zoom. So anything else, Mr. McHale? No, thank you for having me. No Thanks problem. Lot, McHale, we're going to miss you having on the show. Yeah, thank you for one last good fight, all right? All right, man. I'll see you later. All right, all the love, bro. We'll take a quick break here on After This, so we'll be right back with some more callers. Welcome back to After the Whistle. I'm your host today, Jeffrey Bazzi, alongside my co-host, Jimmy Cody. We have some more callers that we're going to have on the show now. And now we're going to invite and welcome Colin Nozick to the show. What's up, Nozick? How are you today? I'm good. Thank you, Jimmy. Jeffrey, how are you guys? We're doing good. We're doing, doing good. good. Um, What's I... the point? What is the point? <laughs> So I know that you wanted to come on and talk some Celtic Sixers because obviously our two teams that we're fans of are facing off in the NBA playoffs right now. And we have game three tonight, but I didn't know if you wanted to bring up games one or two from the other two nights. Just take it from there. Yeah, just thinking about game one, obviously it was huge for Philly to steal one in Boston. It's tough to go into the garden and, and win games in the playoffs. We've seen that in the past. So to go in without the league MVP. The Boston Garden, the not the not the real garden. Excuse me, Jimmy. It's, it's, it's the real garden in my heart. But the Boston Garden, you're correct, and and steal a game. It's, it's been tough in the past, so to do it without the league MVP, it was credit to the Sixers. They really played well. And I think, honestly, having him be back in game two hurt them because the way they played in game one is the way that teams have to play to beat the Celtics, run the floor, outshoot them, get out in transition, and – Embiid kind of clogs up the offense, or at least he appeared to in game two. I think that the uh, Glenn, Glenn over there will, will figure out a way to kind of find that balance for game three, and it will be better. But uh, it was it was just night and day between the two games, and I thought the Celtics came to play on excuse me on Tuesday, on Wednesday, sorry. But they uh, it, it's very interesting that the play style really changed between the two games, so I don't know what to expect from the Sixers going forward. I'm going to be honest, like, does anybody, and this is just my belief, think game one was just a fluke for the Celtics? Like, that's kind of the approach that I had. Like, I, I thought they just didn't really play their best game offensively and defensively. Like, they didn't they didn't really do, I think, anything great I on either side of the floor. Defense, yeah, maybe it was more of the, maybe, but if you look, did they really give up that many points? Like, not really. More of it was just James Harden couldn't miss too. Yeah, I think I think it was like the situational defense. Would you agree with that, Nozick? Like I just thought maybe in the second half they could have performed a little bit better on the defensive end. The offense kind of went cold too, right? It's a bad turnover in the cold. fourth quarter. I think it was more the, the scheme of the defense, and they saw it last year in the finals against the the Warriors. They continued to play drop coverage on screens, and they did it on Curry for six straight games. Which don't know why there wasn't an adjustment, and Horford continued to drop and give Harden room to shoot off of screens or off of dribble handoffs, and it bit him. And I think that that adjustment to go over screens and not drop in situations where bigs would be switching on is an adjustment that was made by the Celtics in Game 2, and I think that's where you kind of saw that, which is why a lot of the shooters for Philly didn't have great shots in Game 2. Of course, as Mark Jackson said, it looked like an L.A. fitness pickup game once you get the third quarter anyway. So, um it was, you're right. It, I don't know if it was a fluke, but it was more of just a, a lackluster game plan. I think the Celtics had in game one. Yeah, I think that's part of it. And also too, like, it's just a tough series. Like the Sixers aren't 
like a complete team of scrubs, right? Like they did have a good season. I know they were missing their best player, but at the same time, like James Harden is not some scrub. So we shouldn't be surprised when James Harden has a big game. And honestly, I know it was surprising though, but Jeffrey, be honest, like you want to see a lot more of that from James Harden in a Sixers uniform. And it kind of stinks that he doesn't do that a little bit more often. Yeah, I'll address that right now before I get into Nozick's other points. I agree. I think when Embiid's on the floor, Harden kind of serves as a facilitator, which is not a bad thing. But I think he looks to pass a little more often than I think he should look to shoot. I think he should hunt his shot a little more when Embiid's out there. Because a lot of the times, and this I think was very evident in game two, they give the ball to Embiid in the post. And it's almost like the other four players in the court, whoever they may be. They just stand out of the way and they'll let Embiid go one on one. And I know that you want Embiid to pretty much touch the ball every time that you go down the court, but you kind of forget that there's other players in the court too who can do pretty good things. We know what James Harden is. We know that Tyrese Maxey's a rising star in the league. And you know that Tobias Harris can chip in and pre- be a pretty effective scorer on most nights. And then there's some other shooters in the team that are lesser known, but I think. Too much of the offense is Embiid-centric and Embiid-centered. And listen, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but I think at the same time, you have to recognize that you got to move the ball around. And I think that's what they did really well in in game one. I thought the ball was just spraying from left to right, and it got the Celtics defense off balance. And luckily, the shots were falling. The shots weren't really falling in game two. I think going they definitely weren't falling in game two. No, they were no, they were not. Definitely weren't falling in game two. No, they were not. They but I were. think going into tonight's game three, I think the Sixers offensively will adjust a little bit. I think we'll see more ball movement. I expect them to make more shots. I think being at home will be nice. I think Embiid getting the trophy will get the crowd going. And I think it's gonna be a close game. I definitely think it's gonna be way closer than it is in game Jeff, two. I'm but gonna be honest. I still think Boston wins. I'm but I, I, I do I, think it's gonna be close. No, no, no. I think these next two games really determine the series. Philly cannot lose both. If they lose both, it's done. It's I, done. I agree. It's done. They have no chance. They have yeah, if you want me to be honest with you, I think even if they take both games, I don't even know if they'd win the series. But I think that's the only chance that they have. They have to defend home for I agree. Because the thing is, they, they did the hard thing already. They won up in Boston. Yes. So now this is what they got to do. This, but they just have to win the three home games because they did take home court. They just have to win the three home games. But it's easier said than done, as we know, because we know that Boston has a very high efficient offense. And I think the thing with Boston is they have so many guys who can score in so many yeah. different ways. I mean, you know what Tatum and Brown are going to give you most nights. I know that Tatum kind of had an off night in game two, but you know that he's probably going to be around 30. He can obviously drop more than that too. But I think it's just the fact that they keep the defense honest. I mean, they could have a wide open three, but someone could be closing out a little bit. They could pass that up and get an even better shot. They just keep moving the ball around. And I think that's what makes their offense so hard to guard. All right. So Nozick, uh, we're a little short on time here. So I want to give you a, a little chance to make a prediction here. Where do you see the rest of this series going from a Celtics point of view? see the Celtics riding some momentum tonight, winning tonight to go up 2-1, and then the, it's very hard to take both games in Philly. I could Great. see them doing I it, though. Like I think I think Philly takes four, evens it back up 2-2, and then Boston wins five and closes it out. Celtics in six is what I thought would happen. It's kind of shaping up that way if they split here in Philly, but as you said, I, I, they have to take both in Philly. The Sixers do if they yeah. want to win the series because if it's even two two going back to Boston, no, that's not good. The Celtics lose at home the rest of the series, so they would have games five and seven to win. And I just I think that it's it's crunch time tonight. It's it starts with tonight. The Sixers need tonight if they want to win the series. Absolutely agree. Couldn't with agree that. more. Absolutely agree with that. All right, Nozick, thank you for coming on, pal. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. Of uh, course. Yep. Thank you for coming on. And we're going to move on to our next caller. Um, it is going to be Eddie Stank. I'm reaching out to him now. He'll be on momentarily. But, Jeff, um, what do you think about that Lakers-Warriors series while we have a second here? Um, yeah. Because I have found that series to be very entertaining. A tale of two games. I mean, that's just the easy thing to say. But you look at on Thursday night, the Warriors come out, and they know that they had to get that game. But – they just came out and they gave it to the Lakers. I thought in game one, the Lakers came in and they were just more ready to play, I think, than the Warriors. And I know that the Warriors were coming off one day rest, but the Warriors are very impressive last night. They look like the Golden State Warriors that we know them to be. Yeah, and that was a very good first two games. It'll be interesting to see how things go down in L.A. All right, Eddie Stank. Um, 
But, um, it's a rough time for you right now. You know, the Eagles Super Bowl loss. Now the Yankees are kind of tanking the Rangers playoff loss. Um, where are you calling us from? Like, what island are you hiding out on? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I uh, actually have a flight to uh, Zimbabwe later today. Yeah, I, are you sure. one way? One way, yeah, one way. Not coming back anytime soon. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> expect that, especially after that yeah, Rangers yeah. loss. I mean, whoops. Um, all right, so the floor is yours. I'm sure you got plenty you want to talk about here. Would love to hear. Uh, sure, much you want to talk about today. All right, well. Well, wait, first, I actually, it's funny. You, if you, it sucks says last episode, but like, if you guys could have like renamed your podcast, because like, we had the worst defensive coordinator in the NFL last year, the Eagles. And then, like, you're a Broncos fan. You guys have like the worst OC, like, head coach. Like, you could have made it some name revolving around like poverty, like, coordinators. Like, oh, coaches. that's true. That is okay. true. That's good. That's very true. Yeah. Um, you're talking about Gannon? You think he was the yeah. worst DC? I will say about Gannon, yes. So I mean, I've seen you on Twitter, so I'm definitely very aware of where you're coming from. <laughs> so you blame the entire Super Bowl loss on Jonathan Gannon, really? Yeah. Um, Giddy, um, at the after party, even after we lost, um, because he was negotiating a contract with the Cardinals the entire time. Oh, okay. So I guess that's a pretty bad way of yeah, going down the Super Bowl. Yeah, and I saw that the Cardinals are going to have to give him a give you guys a pick for that, right? Because there was like tampering or something. Oh, we actually swapped this year's third round pick. Oh, okay. That's what so, it was. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you didn't even really get anything out of it. That a swap. Yeah. What's that um, going to do? I mean, we from the third, second pick of the third round to the third pick of the third round. So, or third oh, first, third, oh third, I, yeah, I, you so. know, I, you know what I keep forgetting? Because you know how you guys picked nine in the first round? I, I, yeah. I, I kept thinking that you guys had that spot. And I'm like, no, yeah. that was just the yeah, stupid was. Uh, Saints just giving you their pick, um, which I completely forgot about. Um, can we get a little Yankee talk from you though? Cause this team is a train wreck. Yeah. Okay. Brian Cashman, uh, the other day he addressed the media. Uh, the media was asking a question. Why did he, he called the press that? conference too. Did you see that? He was yeah, the one who yeah. wanted it. I think he knew the questions already be asked before it. Like, it was actually ridiculous. How did no one ask him about the accusations that he called down to the bullpen and told, and told Holmes that he was going in? Like, I was, how is no one asking him about those accusations? And where is that from? I want everyone to know. So Brandon Tierney from WFAN, people outside of New York probably don't know who he is. He claims that he he read a text off his phone, I think, on whatever day it was after they blew the game to the Guardians. Tuesday? Uh, yeah, it was the day after they blew when Termon pitched really well. And then yeah, they that was about a three ones. Uh-huh. Tuesday? Yeah, I think that was Tuesday day is when okay, he read yeah. it. Yeah, so he was saying that someone um, in the Yankees organization texted him and said that it was Cashman's decision to bring in Holmes, and he called down to Boone. And that's just absolutely ridiculous if that's what's going on, because Boone's just there then. Yeah, and that's kind of the belief that Yankees fans have had for the longest time. Like, Definitely, Brian Cashman yeah. is the end-all, be-all. Crazy. I'm happy that's like, actually, I was right, maybe. Yeah, he's the end-all, be-all. He's the reason this team stinks. Um, we made no improvements in left field. It's a disaster. Um, we still have players who are injured all the time, such as John Carlo, right? Like, we get this guy. He is nothing but injured. Um, a guy like IKF, right? You acquire him. You expect him to have a pretty decent role coming off a gold glove defensive season. Yet, they move him to the outfield. He's a nightmare out there. Now he gets Harrison Bader injured again, um, literally his second game back. I mean, it's just a train wreck out there. And this is one of the worst Yankee teams I've ever seen in my life, if I'm being honest. Uh, yeah, I can't disagree with you. Um, we're lucky we have Garrett Cole carrying us. I don't know if you've seen his stat, uh, wins balls replacement award. He has a 2.4 right now, which leads the MLB. Like it's like a half point higher than Otani's, which is crazy considering he plays two positions. Um, that the is Yankees, crazy. if they didn't have Garrett Cole, the Yankees would be a disaster right now. He is, I don't know how he doesn't have better odds to an MVP. He's, he's just been moving. Yeah, he's certainly been the front runner early for the AL Cy Young, and I hope he keeps it going because realistically, I would say he's the only player on our team who's kind of like over delivering on expectations right now. Like yeah, literally, it. Oh, maybe yeah. Rizzo, maybe Rizzo. The other Rizzo, thing yeah, too, been playing pretty well too. I can't complain about DJ. I guess uh, he's been fine. DJ. Yeah. yeah, Glaber's been okay. Like I, I like the problem has just been you know when when your star player like Aaron Judge is hurt, it's just so tough to overcome. What were you about to say, Jeff? This has nothing to really do with the Yankees as a team. It's more so the teams that they're competing with. The AL East is stacked. Yeah, that's the problem. Like, we have a winning record, but we can't even enjoy it because the Rays are good. The Orioles are good. Yeah. The Rays haven't really cooled off since that 13-0 start. They're going for the best 32-game start ever today. Red Sox were kind of that team that 
didn't really we didn't really know what we were going to get we thought that they'd be kind of bad but they're 20 not 19 to 14 excuse me well when they make an awesome free agent signing that really helps them with the, the yoshida signing i mean he's raking again like, yeah he's still just on fire and then toronto was probably the other team that was probably gonna be at the top with the yankees at least that was the prediction going into the year they're 18 to 14 they're still i guess slowly finding their way yeah i, I mean listen the al east is gonna be a dog fight all year but here's the thing the rays and the orioles Compared to the Blue Jays and the Yankees, I, I feel like, and the Red Sox too, well, the Red Sox not so much, but I would say the Rays and the Orioles have had a little bit easier of schedules than the Yankees have. Would you agree with that, Ed? Definitely, yeah. The Rays, what really propelled the Rays, which I don't like being one of those guys at all, because the Rays are a fantastic team. They're very well managed. They have hitting, they got pitching, they got bullpen, they got it all. But they did start off the season against the Tigers, Athletics, and um, another feeble team, if I'm not wrong. It's the Nationals. Like that, uh, yeah, Nationals. Yeah. So then that, that was, I mean, most you're obviously supposed to win the games where you're playing bad teams is which, what they did. And they started out like 9-0. And but that, those are teams they normally wouldn't play because you got to remember the new schedule format, which the Yankees are going to get to play those teams too, though. That's stupid. Yeah, I agree. I'd rather play our division teams just so I can beat up on the Orioles. Like we went two one against the Orioles, you know, when we played them. Like we went, we split with the Blue Jays. I don't, I don't when we know. Them. Beating up the Orioles is still going to be a thing. I don't know. I mean, who knows? I mean, when Judge is there, when Glaber's there, we certainly got a chance because they hit the hell out of the Orioles. It's not like the Orioles pitching is that great. And I would say if they were going up, if they were all going up against the AL East lineups all the time, they surely wouldn't look as good, right? No, uh, they would not. Yeah, yeah definitely not. All right, Ed, uh, what else would you like to talk about? Anything else you want to add? Um, let me think. Uh, the St. Louis Cardinals are like the worst team in baseball. I'm not even joking. Like, I'm not even yeah. uh, and why do you think that is? So I actually saw something on uh, Twitter, actually. It was like a minor leaguer. I don't know if he's still on a team or anything. I know who the guy was. But it was a guy who was in the Cardinals organization a few uh, years ago. And he said that – I'm trying to pull it up. One of like their main development coaches or something tries to teach their pitchers not to strike batters out. He tries to teach them to may let the batters make contact, and that's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. That's just a little like uh, input. Isn't that bizarre? I mean, also, don't you think the Yachty thing has something to do with it? Absolutely. Like people undervalue how uh, well, like what Yachty brought to the team. Like he the, he called every he called every pitch for all the pitchers. Like he probably like as a pitcher, it's probably so hard without him. He was he's such a good catcher, and um, yeah, him and Wainwright's been out. Like those are the two like like main people in their locker room. So that's definitely been a big uh big problem. All right, Ed. Thanks for coming on, my man. Thanks a lot, Ed. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Yeah. All right, and then we're going to be moving on to our next guy, Tom Spallone, in a minute here. I think that's kind of interesting, though, about the Cardinals. Like, you know, they were a team that I thought was going to win the Central. Me too. And for them, they're just completely no-show at the beginning of the season has been such a surprise. I mean, it really has. But I do think Yadier not being a part of the team anymore, not calling the games, definitely has a lot to do with it's it. It's funny. I actually didn't even think of that, but that is 100% true. All right, Tom, what's up, my man? What's going on, Phyllis? How are we doing today? Good, good. Hey, Tom, how are you? Let's uh, let's let's hear it. We know this is going to be like a Jones parade you got for us, so just give it to us. First off, boys, I just wanted to say uh, I appreciate you having me on for this last time. I know this is uh, it's the last episode for your boys at W Loy, so I just want to say I appreciate you boys uh, doing this for us. It's, uh, it's been a fun, uh, fun show for everyone, I, I believe. Yeah, um, it's been a fun time. We love every, having everybody on. It's a blast. I mean, I just wish that, you know, there'd be a few more episodes, but I'm glad that we get to wrap it up here by having all everybody call back in. We still got Bob coming on. You know, Bob's going to give us a good fight for about 10 minutes. And then we got some other callers too. But, you know, Tom, I'm more interested to hear what you have to say. Yes, sir. Uh, no, yeah, I'm excited for this. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this upcoming NFL season. Uh, I believe the Giants just had a really nice uh, – Nice draft and uh, free agency, and then uh, the camps are starting soon. So and schedule um, release is next week, a week from yesterday. Yeah, yeah, it's coming up in, in about a week. Uh, I already have Jets fans in my ear telling me that they're they're ready to beat us week one. I mean, I, I'd be more than happy to face the Jets week one. You know, a team with no chemistry uh, starting out the year. So you know, I and wouldn't plus, have any issue with that. Plus, Sauce, you never know. Like he might be at like a Knicks game or something. You're not sure if he's going to show up. Yeah, it seems like Sauce and Rodgers would rather be at the Garden than maybe on the Tigers field so far. But I guess that's that's none of my business. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree with that. 
Yeah, that's very true. But yeah, I agree. The Giants have an interesting outlook this season. We were talking earlier with Mikhail, and he thinks they can contend with the division. I mean, I don't know if they're better than the Eagles and the Cowboys. I don't think so. But I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that, Tom. I'm sure you're going to say they can compete. Yeah, no, I think they'll definitely be competitive this year. Um, it's just obviously tough to compete with Philly uh, because Philly, I mean, they, they did lose Gardner Johnson uh, and a couple of linebackers, but, you know, they kept Slay, they kept kept Bradbury. And they had, in my opinion, they had a really good draft and they had a lot of guys that fell to them, including Jalen Carter and uh, Nolan Smith. So And they have yeah. N'Kobe Dean, too, from last year, who fell. Yeah, no, N'Kobe Dean fell to them. Yeah, a lot of these Georgia guys, is, is, they seem to love. I mean, they had, they're probably the best defense of college football the last two or three years. So you can't uh, really blame Harry Resman for just going to that college and, and picking those guys. So, uh, yeah, Dean's probably going to start the linebacker spot, honestly, this year, I would assume. Yeah, I would so think gonna... so, especially after the loss of um, Edwards. Yes. Yeah, TJ Edwards. So, yeah, we're going to see him. And then I know Jordan Davis was kind of hurt last year, so he's, he'll probably be back ready to go. So, I mean, this, this Eagles defense is really going to be tough for the Giants um especially up front but i'm i'm really happy that the giants addressed a big uh, couple of needs in this draft uh and that was the center that they drafted from minnesota uh they really needed a center because the last time the giants even drafted a center was i believe like 2014 or 2015 so yeah that's and, good you got to uh, you got to sure up the the up front that's like the most important thing no, no. i th- if you look at the teams who are most in analytics and they know who those two teams are it's the 49ers and the eagles and do you know what they value most drafting linemen and they both have excellent O lines and D lines. It starts in the trenches. Yeah. It does. <laughs> no, that's definitely true. I, I agree with that. I and the think... giants got a good D line. So they got half the, you know, problem figured out, I think. Yeah, no, yeah, definitely. I mean, the, the giant D line is definitely one of the strongest suits. They just paid uh, Dexter Lawrence a pretty big extension yesterday. You I'm happy with that? that? Yeah, no, I was happy the money came in pretty well. I think he get, he's getting the same amount of money as the Commanders. Deron Payne is also a very good D-tackle. I'm, I'm happy we got the deal done before the Jets did with Quinn, though, because now they're just going to have to be paying more money. Yep, uh, probably. So I, I was happy about that. And, um, Which they might not think, even have, because have you seen Rodgers' cap hit over the next two years? Honestly, I haven't. How much is, is it really that well, much? Well, they owe him so much. They owe – like, if he plays next year, they're going to have to – I mean, they can be converted into signing bonus, and it probably will be. But it's like a fifty million dollar give out that they got to give for this year and next year. Like it, it's yeah, a lot of money. Yeah, I wonder if they'll even maybe like restructure it. They know. definitely will, but I don't know. Like it still has to get done, and you never know with that guy, man. Like you never know what you're gonna get. He's a little, he's a little out there. Yeah, no, no yeah. teams are definitely still trying to figure out like the money situation just because post draft and everything but um i think that the next thing that giants really need to take care of is the saquon barkley situation because obviously he's still working out on his own right now but he's not going to be showing up to uh any camps or anything until the his contract squared away because he he's he's not going to play under the franchise tag i don't think so what is he looking for like i don't know if he's going to get a deal that's longer than two years yeah like what would you give him like two years maybe 40 million like two years 35 Two years, thirty-five. Like I don't even know. Like where do you go? Honestly, I don't think they can really go over twelve a year at this point. So it'd be max like two years, twenty-four mil. I know, but who's to say he would sign with that? Like there might be a team. With, like it's interesting too because Eckler's also looking for a contract at the same time, and I would say that he's probably like yep. the most comparable to Saquon, just because they both are like such a focal point of the offense. Um, but yeah. Tom, you can't ignore that. Like running back is a replaceable position. Like you don't think if the giants, maybe like, say they don't work something out with Saquon, maybe they go get another running back next year in the draft instead. Like, I understand he's the heart and soul of your team, but he is replaceable. It's a running back. Yeah. And I know he's definitely replaceable, but it seems like the way the giants have approached this, this year, like they're expecting Saquon to be back. So I'm, I'm hoping that they, end up getting something done. I mean, at this point, no, I don't really think a lot of teams are going to, I don't really know if any team's going to offer Saquon at this point since the running back market is so busted ever since right. um, Miles Sanders got that deal from the Panthers. I think it was like pretty cheap, like seven or eight mil. Obviously that's about what he's worth. I mean, you could kiss uh, Barkley's 14 to 15 mil that he wanted right at the window. You know what I mean? So that he's not getting that. Yeah, so, it's tough because I don't know. I, I still think the Giants are are in, are in control. They drafted a running back from Oklahoma in like the fourth or fifth round, who is who's I think could be good, but he's he's nothing more than a backup. So they don't have any any RB one on the depth chart. So it's really Saquon or 
there's really nothing no other season for next year. They got to bring him back. Yeah, it's just tough because I feel like yeah. a lot of their offense is full, solely focused around Saquon, and it would be hard to let him go. And I don't know where they would get that production. I feel like that would have to be made up by multiple people. It's just tough, though, because he is the heart and soul, like you said, of the offense. Yeah, absolutely. That would be a drastic change. All right, Tom, anything yeah. else you'd like to add today? Um, only thing I really add maybe on the baseball front is I really need the New York Yankees to figure it out in these next couple of weeks or else I'm the, the whole summer is just going to be just miserable watching baseball. I mean, I, I mean, the only good thing is the New York Mets are also crumbling at the same time. So that's the only thing. Give me a little bit of positive, uh, like mental space, but yeah. you know, the, the Yankees really need to figure it out here. I, I agree. They definitely need to figure it out, but you know, what gives me hope? Number one, it's a long season. Number two, we are eventually going to play easy teams. Number three, have you seen the Mets' June schedule? Go on the calendar and look if you have not. Really? Go look. They play the Yankees. They play Philly. I'm pretty sure they play Atlanta. I hey, they, we're not very Oh, right like now. it is going to be – you watch the June swoon will happen. It is coming back again. The Mets in June, it is going to be another Met June this year. I'm telling you, look at the calendar if you get a chance. I saw a meme about it the other day with a Frank the Tank video where you're screaming in the back. People are already making fun of the Mets, and June didn't even happen yet. We're in May, and they're already giving a home runs up to Javi Baez. Yeah, I agree. It's a great yeah. laugh, Sploan. It is a good laugh. The, you can always count on the Mets for a good time. Yeah, you definitely can. But that's that's hilarious. But yeah, for the Yankees, they, they got to get uh, they got to get healthy. Obviously, like Rodon and Severino got to get healthy, and then we'll see what happens from there. So yeah, and then Aaron Boone or Brian Cashman's got to figure out whatever the hell they're doing with that bullpen. That's a good second step, I think. And then also too, if John Carlo yeah. just wants to get some bubble wrap or something, he can maybe do that. And then Judge too. <laughs> Too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, Judge is a little different because it's an effort play. Stanton, like, he yeah. like he hurts himself like picking up like a broomstick or something at home. Like, I don't even know. Like, he, he's sweeping the floor and he's like, ah, I pulled my hamstring. I can't play for five weeks. Like, that's the John Carlo injury. Yeah, he's just so so too strong where he's just getting hurt left and right. It's yeah, that's that's what it seems. I guess that's the excuse. All right, yeah. Tom. Thank you as always for coming on, my man. Thanks, that's Tom. Awesome, appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you. All right, we got two more left. We got Bobby McGinnis, who hopefully, hopefully will give us some juice here. You know he's going to. You know yeah, gonna, he always yeah, does. Yeah, he always gives us some juice. I, I'm sure he's going to be talking Jets or Mets or something. Um, Always interesting. And then we got the the Fallons. We'll wrap it up with the, the Fallons wins. All right, Bob, the floor is all yours. Welcome to the show, Bob. Welcome to the show. Hit us. Jimmy and Jeffrey, the uh, grand finale. I'm very excited to be on. Yes, and yeah, we would love to have you. Yeah, on. we are we are happy to have you, Bob. So, uh, I where I want to go with this conversation. So I'll kind of just uh, see where we end up. But to start, I saw um, I kind of want to know Jeffrey's thoughts on uh, the Eagles getting DeAndre Swift. I mean, I think he still has some juice left. Um, and Heck I don't yeah, think he does. The, I don't think the Lions really utilized him in the best way. And, I mean, even I could run behind that Eagles offensive line. So, uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts on uh, DeAndre Smith, uh, Swift? Yeah, thanks for the question. I love it. I thought coming into the year that Gainwell, Kenneth Gainwell, that is, he was going to be probably the number one running back. And then we signed Rashad Penny, and I'm thinking, okay, it's a nice insurance policy to have a number two there, along with Boston Scott. But there was a part of me where I felt like we were going to do something else and I didn't know what it was, but to get DeAndre Swift in the draft. And also I don't remember what we gave up to get him uh, a bag of baseballs. So basically that equivalent to get DeAndre Swift was huge. And I do think that you're right, Bob. I think there is some juice left in the tank for DeAndre Swift and he's still pretty young. And I think the fact that he's coming home to Philly, that's where he's from. And he went to high school there. I think that's another nice element too, but I do think he is a dynamic runner. And I do think that, I guess he was a little underutilized. I know that Jamal he was, he was definitely underutilized. Jamal there. Williams playing really well, I think, was a part of that. But he's gonna be a huge part of your passing game. Like I'm gonna be I honest, he too. he is so much better, I think, at catching passes than Miles Sanders was. I think that's gonna give you guys a whole new element of your offense. That's why I like it. Also, I think for the fact that now that we have a clear cut number one, I think it takes a little bit less pressure off Kenneth Gainwell and Rashad Penny, because Rashad Penny, like DeAndre Swift has dealt with some injuries the last couple of years. So. Those guys, I would say, especially Penny and Boston Scott, they're not sure things. I could see Ganwell being right. successful, but and I, but I think Swift is certainly an improvement over I him. think the fact that you bring in Swift, he's clearly going to be the first down back, probably second down back. He could be a three down back. Now, I don't see that happening just because of who we have. I think we could use Gainwell on third down, depends, depending on the situation where you're on the field. But I love the move. I think DeAndre Swift 
adds another element to the Eagles offense that I think they lost in Miles Sanders, but I think they got some of it back. All right, Bob. So hit us with your Mets or Jets point. We know you got something you want to say. Oh, yeah, Jimmy. Uh, it's been a while since I've been on the show. So since then, we've had a lot of news regarding the New York Jets. We have arguably a top five player of all or quarterback of all time, uh, a surefire Hall of Famer now wearing that New York Jets green. What, what can I expect from the Jets this year, boys? Um, I'm going to be honest. Here's what your expectations should be. They are, they should be a playoff team, right? That's like the way you look at it. Is is that the bare minimum you think in your mind, a playoff team? Yeah. I mean, I, I like, I want to be fair with my expectations. I think if we miss the playoffs, I mean, that would be a disaster. Yes, I agree too. Like, I think if you get to the, box. I think you got to win a game in the playoffs too, to make it successful. But I think honestly, if you want to be honest, I think the only way would be honestly a success is if you make or win the Super Bowl, right? uh yeah so jimmy i actually i agree like 100 percent, and that's what i've been telling like my friends i know like tom and i had like an argument about it um because i said that i have super bowl expect like not super bowl expectations for the jets but it's super bowl or bust so what i mean is like yeah like i don't necessarily like expect them to come out of the afc they're not the favorite in the afc but and the afc is loaded exactly there's a lot of good quarterbacks in the afc, a lot of the AFC. so if if the Jets don't make it to the Super Bowl, I can be disappointed. I think that's very fair to say. After you just invested in Aaron Rodgers, um, and the team is honestly a pl- playoff ready. Last year, the defense was top five, definitely a playoff defense, and now I think the offense is caught up. So, yeah, I mean, if we don't make the playoffs, uh, or sorry, if we don't get to the Super Bowl, I can be disappointed. I- I'm not. I'm not just satisfied with the playoff win. But also, too, like, you don't get Aaron Rodgers to just make the playoffs. Like, you get Aaron Rodgers so you're Super Bowl contenders. So I think that's why that's your reasoning. And I'm honestly 100% correct. Like, I think that should be the expectation as a Jet fan. the question is, do you think the Jets with Rodgers now on the team, obviously, do you think they can match up with the Buffaloes and the Kansas Cities and the Cincinnati's of the world? I don't know if they're going to be able to match up with Cincinnati and Kansas City because I think that they're just a little bit above everyone else in the AFC. But I would throw them in the same tier as like a good day Ravens team, a good day Buffalo team, a good day Dolphins team, a good day Chargers team, a good day Jacksonville Jaguars team. Um, Like there's a lot of potential teams that I think can compete. I think that if you want me to also be honest with you, um, you look at the other teams in the AFC North, like the Browns and the Steelers, I would say the Jets are probably a little bit better than, than them. So I don't know if they're better coach, but I would say, especially the Steelers, I don't know if they're better coach than them, but I would say that they, like, they're a little bit above those teams. So if you look at the AFC competition, like the, it's, it looks a little bit better for the Jets than maybe one would think. But I think the ultimate question is like, what Rodgers are we getting? Because if you're getting the best Rodgers and things are really rolling and everyone's playing at the level they can be, yeah, sure, the team's going to be great. But if he's running for his life out there and, he, you know, it's more like a little bit more like last season where he's having random interceptions to scrubs on the Lions uh, defense, like, you know, who, who knows what you're going to get. But I think... I'm expecting him to have a bounce back year. That's honestly my expectation. I could see him. I, I'm expecting at least 35 touchdown passes. I would say, especially with Garrett Wilson. I think Garrett Wilson, I'm being honest. This dude was working with nothing at receiver last year. And I think if you do well working with nothing, so that's why I always gave extra credit to, like I said, DJ Moore, Terry McLaurin, Garrett Wilson, because they do enough. They do amazing things with nothing. Now we get to Aaron Rodgers. Like, it's not crazy to say that he could lead the NFL in receiving next year because he's the number one option. And I just don't really think any other receiver on that team is worth, like, is up to where he is. And I just feel like you have to get him the ball. Yeah, no, it's not crazy to say. And and Rodgers already kind of hinted at comparing him to to Devontae Adams on the McAfee podcast the other day. Could have been a confidence Um, boost. Yeah, definitely. But at the same time, we saw the route runner that, that Garrett Wilson was last year, and you mentioned it with three uh, horrific quarterbacks. Um, and he still had, I, I know he was over a thousand, I think he was near 1200, uh, 1200 yards. So, yeah, I mean, the ceiling is super high for Garrett Wilson. 
Um, unfortunately, we couldn't add too much to the offensive line, uh, as you kind of alluded to um, when you mentioned Aaron Rodgers running for his life, potentially. Um, yeah, it would have been nice if one of those top four tackles fell to us in the draft. However, Do you think not. the Patriots actually did that on purpose? You've seen that rumor, right? Like an NFL GM said the Patriots just made the trade to screw over the Jets. I think if that's true, that's hilarious. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't put it past the Patriots. <laughs> they seem like a pretty spiteful organization, but they have a lot of holes themselves. So if that was like the true ace, um, then I think that's silly. I think they, they wanted uh, who did they draft? Chris Christian Rodriguez. Gonzalez. Uh, Gonzalez, Christian yeah. Gonzalez. Yeah, I, I mean, he was the best corner in, in the draft, in my opinion, and they saw an opportunity where they could probably get him a few picks later, um, and they picked up some picks. I, it was a good move by the Patriots. All right, Bob, um, we only got a couple minutes left, so is there anything that you want to say here before we move on? Yeah, I guess uh, I know I had my, my last show uh, called a comeback last Tuesday, and, and just looking back on the on the four years for Tom and myself, and we've done a lot of uh, collaborations, the four of us. It was a lot of fun, uh, definitely a great experience, and I, I don't know what the future holds for you guys. For me, it's going to be uh, less less uh, in front of the camera, um, more on the marketing side, but still a wonderful experience. And and um, so shout out to all the people that helped you at W Lloyd and and made this possible. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm uh, glad I'm glad works. that we collaborated with you guys a lot. We'll always have that awesome Jimmy Garoppolo Tannehill to a fight. Nothing can, nothing can take that away from that 45 minute fight. And, and that was great. That was, honestly, that would have been a hell of an episode had everyone been here in studio. It's a shame COVID took that away from us. But um, Bob, thanks as always for coming on. You know, I like to bump heads with you talking sports. I respect your knowledge. It's always fun to argue with you. Good luck uh, after school. Thanks, guys. You too. Yeah, best of luck. Thanks, Bob. All right, we got one caller left. We got the Fallon sisters coming on. We got Michaela. And we got Michaela and Lauren. I'm sure they're going to want to talk about the Celtics like they always do. They're two of the biggest Celtics fans I know. And they're also no two of our best friends. So it's cool that we're ending oh, our yes. show with them. Um, hopefully Michaela picks up though, because we gotta we gotta we gotta rush here. All right, Michaela, you got three minutes. Hit us. Let's talk some Celtics. Come on. Well, Colin stole our thunder. I didn't know. Colin didn't steal your thunder. You got better things to say. Yeah, I'm sure you can one up them right now. This series, like obviously the first game was rough coming into it. But I think the Celtics gained a lot of steam in the second game, obviously, like, blowing them out by, like, 30. Um, I think Derek White is going to be a big factor in this series. He's very – I think he's underrated, you know, along with – He is. He is underrated. Guys. He is underrated. Yeah. You're right. And I think he's great. So, I think he's going to make a big difference. Yeah. No, he's been playing really well. He's a great addition for them over the past couple seasons. He's definitely, I think, overperformed his role. Yeah, I think definitely underrated. The fact that he can drive and shoot, too. I mean, he can definitely hurt you one way or the other. Yeah. Uh, by the way, that was Lauren. It's Lauren and Michaela on the phone. We should clarify. For the correct thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, of course. <laughs> and then, Michaela, what's what's your outlook here for the, uh, for the Celtics? Um, I was surprised when Embiid came back from his injury and we blew him out by three points. And that was very surprising. And I think it was. that Payton Pritchard should get some more court time, if you ask me. Okay. And All right. He's a bit of an underrated player. I know we have a big we have a big team with a lot of good players, but I think our bench is very good. Our we have a very deep bench. So you do. Um it's just tough, I guess, taking away minutes from Marcus, right? Marcus Smart, yeah. because yeah. you know, him and White and Brogdon. They're like multidimensional players. The only other guards that you really have are, I guess, Brown is technically a shooting guard, but, you know, he right. kind of can swing with the forward position. Um, but um, at the same time, like, I think there's a lot of potential uh, for the Celtics going forward in a lot of different areas. And I think this playoff run is something you guys should be very excited about because if you guys can get past the Sixers, it's either the Knicks or the Heat. I'm sorry. I'm going to be honest. I think that's easy pickings for the Celtics. I, I, yeah, I would think that there's a very good chance they can make another finals run. So we'll see who comes out of the West if the Celtics do get that far. Definitely. So anything you guys want to say about the Celtics, uh, the look forward here in the last minute of the show history? Well, I'd like to end with Celtics rule, Sixers rule. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, you guys um, had a great show. Thank you for having us on. Um, it's always good to look forward to and hear what you have to say, and we appreciate being the last guests. 
Yeah, yeah, we appreciate you guys coming on to talk whether it was Patriots or whether it was Celtics or whatever. I'm um, sorry about the Bruins, but guys, yeah, I'm sorry. That was a really tough way to go down. I, I kind of yeah, felt I bad. I was honestly shocked. I kind of yeah. felt, I felt bad. I felt bad for you guys. I didn't feel bad for anyone else though. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> All right though. But guys, thank you for coming on. Uh, yeah, I think this is going to, I morning. think this is going to be it. The time is ticking here for us. So to everyone, all the listeners, all the callers, anybody who's ever interacted with us. Everyone who's been involved with the show. Thank thank you. you. That's all I got to say is thank you. It's been a wild ride. Thank you.